And so let's think about the general types of surveys uh, that can be separate or it can be combined, you know, based on the, uh, the user's requirement. Uh, you know, if you, this column, uh, the first column here, which is a power quality survey, you know, this is probably the first bullet here is probably the number one reason why someone does a power quality survey. Uh, is to determine the cause and the source of the, the power problems. Uh, if you're having power problems that's causing things to fail prematurely or causing things to misoperate, things of that nature, and obviously you need to find a culprit. Uh, so you go out, you find a culprit, you provide the mitigation, and then hopefully you'll solve the, uh, the problem. Um, determine the suitability for power expansion or installation of new equipment. That's a very common one. Uh, I get those type of questions all the time when I'm out and travel. Uh, you know, I, I have to put additional load on this particular panel. Is this panel suitable uh, for handling the additional load? Well, how do I know that if I don't monitor uh, to get an idea? Um, evaluate the impact of power quality on facility costs. Uh, put you on equal footing with your utility. Uh, in this industry, for power quality uh, applications, we see a lot of finger pointing, where here we're sitting in this classroom now and the lights flicker. Uh, usually the first thought is, oh, the utility must be doing something out on the grid that's causing the lights to flicker. I mean, that is a possibility, but statistically speaking, it's probably within the, the building itself. Uh, but putting you on equal footing with your utility is that you have documented and information. So, if, in fact, the instrumentation or service that you employed says that the PQ type problems are generated by the utility, now you can go to your utility account representative with documented evidence that that's the case. Uh, and then the, uh, the final bullet, uh, select the correct mitigation equipment. Very often you have what I call misapplied technology. Uh, well, we have the lights up, like we'll put a UPS in there or, or some other device, just a general off the cuff without any information to kind of back that up. So, you know, once you determine the cause in the first bullet here, once you determine the cause of the power problems, that allows you to select the correct mitigation equipment. Energy survey is, is fairly straightforward. You want to understand where the energy is being used. Uh, if it's part of an energy management program, you definitely want to do that. You want to determine usage patterns. Um, what's how many energy, uh, what's the KWH consumption during peak hours versus off peak hours. Those, those are examples. Uh, part of any energy management program is identify where there are areas for energy reduction. Uh, that's very important. And what's the overall goal? It's to reduce the costs. Uh, so there's, uh, and again, these surveys can be separate or they can be combined. And the key to that is which tools are available for a given task. Uh, for power quality, handheld PQ instruments are probably the most common. Uh, when uh, there's a lot of time a survey, it's usually uh, short-lived. And what I mean by that is not permanently installed. So a client was, it's having, currently having PQ problems. Uh, the natural reaction is that you go out with a portable, you monitor you the point of common coupling or where the source of the PQ problem might be. The instrument stays there until you record the data and then analyzing the data, making the determinations, selecting the correct mitigation. That's usually how it goes. Um, and so handheld portables are usually a big players in that particular space. And then of course, there's permanent PQ. Uh, there's more specialized uh, products such as oscilloscopes, you know, fault recorders, spectrum analyzers. Those devices tend to be more specialized where the PQ instruments, whether they're permanently installed, tends to be more versatile. Uh, so they have the ability to not only provide PQ related data, but also energy and demand data as well. That's where today's instrumentations are.
And of course, uh, energy survey, pretty straightforward, handheld, you know, whether it be uh, portables or meters, uh, permanently installed, existing utility meters, those are all uh, typical tools that will be available depending on the objective. Is, is it a power quality survey? Is it an energy survey? Is it a survey that's going to combine both? And the key is making sure you have the right tools for the job. And, you know, there are various different tools, again, from, you know, portable, uh, more advanced instrumentation to, let's say, uh, with less capability, uh, if you're looking to perform a certain task. Uh, and of course, there's the good old DBM, and then of course, there's permanently installed as well. The one thing to keep in mind is that uh, when you're choosing the right tool for the job is it's all about resolution and, and what the objective is. For example, uh, you wouldn't use an energy meter or a meter that is designed from the ground up for energy management. You wouldn't use that meter in a PQ application for the simple fact that those meters, the resolution is typically measured in seconds. Inappropriate for PQ applications when you're attempting to record PQ, uh, PQ events that might be just a few cycles in duration. Uh, PQ instruments will typically have a resolution in microseconds. So you want to be able to record those uh, PQ events that may last a few cycles. You also may want to record the PQ events that are subcycle. Uh, back in the old days, they, there were names for it. They were called spikes. They were called impulses. Uh, those are events that that typically last less than one AC cycle. But those events are, can also cause uh, equipment to misoperate and things of that nature. So you wanna be able to record those. Uh, the point is that I can use an instrument that is designed from the ground up, engineered from the ground up for PQ applications. I can also use it for energy applications, but I can't use meters for energy applications for PQ applications. So that's something to keep in mind. You also wanna make sure that the meter conforms to any monitoring standards. Uh, that's to make sure that everyone, regardless of the manufacturer, adheres to a certain standard. At the end of the day, you have repeatability of measurement. And so you wanna make sure that it's, you know, 4-30, for example, if you're doing PQ monitoring, if you're doing harmonic analysis, uh, to see if you're complying with the harmonic standard. You want to make sure the meter, uh, the device that you're using adheres to that. The, there's the approach uh, as far as what the objectives it may be different, but the one thing that surveys have in common is the bullets that you see listed here. The safety considerations, instrument connections, transducer selection, an example of a transducer selection is which current probes are you using? Very often I see scenarios where, you know, someone uses a current probe that may not be quite appropriate for the application. Maybe the range is too large, maybe the monitoring too small of a current, which can have adverse effects on the, uh, on your uh, data set. Uh, so we'll talk about these things. And then again, there's the monitoring procedure. There's an approach that you would take uh, as far as at least what we've seen in the years that we've been in existence, it's again, coming up on 60, uh, that we've seen uh, as far as the modern procedure that is most efficient and yields the most results. As far as safety uh, considerations, there's, you know, there's NFPA uh, 70E. You want to always want to make sure that you practice that. There's TANSI, there's OSHA, of course. There's local codes, depending on which region that you're in. And then there's corporate policy. An example of a corporate policy, yes, Stranis is very knowledgeable as far as uh, PQ analysis. And, you know, someone can send me a data file and I can pretty much tell them what's going on in the given application. Uh, I can even go out to a site and look over and install a shoulder. But the corporate policy tells me that I'm prohibited from touching anything. I can't touch a lead and put it on a point to monitor either voltage or current. So that's an example of a corporate policy. 
there's a basic procedure uh, and a lot of it is really in the planning and prep prep preparation easy for me to say before you easy, uh, even visit the site you know what your objectives are so that when you're at the site you're using your time most efficiently um, there's the inspection stage then there's monitoring itself that's the fun part you know you, all the information that you've learned and in the previous modules, now you're ready to put that to use in the monitoring stage. Uh, then there's the analysis. Uh, you know, you create the, the instrumentation, creates the data sets, the analysis, and then based on the analysis, you provide the solution. And in some cases, you may have to repeat if necessary. If, it, if it's a complex problem that you're chasing, you may have to repeat if necessary at different locations. I always, you know, kind of look at survey objectives as the three W's, the what, where, when. Um, you know, what are the objectives? That's the most important, what are the objectives? Is it PQ troubleshooting? Are you trying to solve a PQ problem? It's causing downtime, causing premature equipment failure, uh, those type of things. Or is it an energy survey? Uh, you know, my energy uh, costs are extraordinarily high month to month. Uh, I need to perform a study to find out when it's be, where it's being consumed, when it's being consumed, where areas that I can reduce to uh, at the end of the day to uh, save money. Where to monitor, that's very important. Uh, usually the approach is, is that you monitor where the source is. And what I mean by that is if you have a, uh, a load that is malfunctioning or a load that is failing prematurely, then usually the first approach is to monitor the supply power that's feeding the affected load. And then based on the results, you may have to work your way back to what we call the point of common coupling. That's where the client meets the utility. Because uh, utility. Uh, very often you record an event, but the next step is where did the event originate it from? Now, in certain cases, waveform signatures, which is you know, making sure that you have the right tool that provides the waveform signatures. In a lot of cases, the waveform signature can often identify the type of what's causing the PQ event. And then of course, when to monitor. Uh, time of the day, um, you wanna look for events that coincide, uh, you know, let's say activity that's going on with, uh, in the facility. You wanna look for that, what I call consistent correlation between events that's recorded by the instrumentation and some activity that's going on within the facility. You know, once you have that consistent correlation, then you've, you've come a long way as far as identifying the source of the problem. It's, uh, you know, as far as the equipment history, you know, catalog any equipment failures or site problems. Uh, for example, if uh, if I had a production line that was shutting down at, at the same time every day, you want to catalog that. Um, uh, any outside influence, things of that nature. You know, in a lot of cases, you want to play detective, you know, at, interview the operators, other personnel that could provide valuable clues. So it's, it's, you know, finding PQ problems, is, it's like being a detective. You, you want to, you know, get information from as many sources as you can um, and then it makes the monitoring more efficient. You know, again, I keep drawing back to the uh, consistent correlation between activities that might be occurring within the building or outside the building to actual data that's being recorded by the instrumentation. And then of course, for energy, understand the facility. Uh, if you have a chance to review schematic load types, things of that nature, uh, are there any saving measures being uh, employed? Uh, so those are all very important things when, when you're going out here during the survey uh, that makes your survey more efficient. And then of course the inspection. Uh, use all your senses, but don't touch, uh, so to speak. Uh, look for things like uh, abnormal odors or the abnormal sounds, uh, look, uh, a visual inspection. Loose connections. Loose connections are notorious. Uh, code connection, uh, code violations. They're probably the most notorious. Uh, for example, a legal loop to the ground bonds can cause havoc uh, 
ground loops, things of that nature. Uh, chances are, and what I've seen in my experience is that, particularly with the new facility that it's experiencing PQ problems, it's usually this stage here, the visual inspection usually reveals where the problem is, not necessarily something failing, but it's this visual inspection, the loose connections, the code violations, the wiring problems, miswiring problems. Uh, and so uh, generally when uh, with new installation or retrofits, you generally want to pay particular uh, attention to the visual inspection stage. Where to monitor? Uh, and again, for PQ, is it a localized problem? Again, as I said earlier, you monitor the equipment that's being affected or the circuit that's feeding that area. Uh, otherwise, it's usually the point of common coupling. Why? Because the first, one of the first things that you look for uh, is if an event is recorded, where is it coming from? Where is it originating from? Is it originating on the load side, the customer side of the meter, or is it originating on the uh, utility side of the meter? And, and so that's very important. Um, it all plays into what we call directivity. Uh, we use terms like upstream and downstream. In fact, a lot of the instrumentation that uh, that has intelligence built in now these days uh, will often tag events as being upstream or downstream. And remember, it is the point, the point of reference is where you monitor. So if I'm monitoring at the point of common coupling and the instrumentation tags events as being upstream, then I know the events are being originated from the utility. Uh, if they're tagged downstream, then I know the events are occurring downstream of the monitoring location. Uh, if I'm monitoring at a service panel, at a, an electrical panel that might be feeding, you know, that might be further down the line from the point of common coupling. Well, if the instrumentation tells me that the, uh, the events are originating upstream, I can't immediately point to the utility. I know that the events are occurring upstream from that particular monitoring location. That sort of lends back to a previous slide to where you may have to repeat the process. So you monitor, you analyze, you determine you know, what's what, and then you may have to repeat the process to kind of pinpoint and narrow down the problem. Uh, energy, it depends on what the survey objectives is. Uh, it may, and most of the time, it's usually for the entire facility. For example, that might be a building. You know, what's the building's energy consumption on a monthly basis? Um, but then once you determine that, you may want to do additional monitoring to say, okay, you know, the, you know, the energy profile of this building is X you know, KWH. Who are the biggest consumers? Uh, and that comes down to individual loads and processes and things of that nature. Instrument connected. How should the instrument be connected? Phase to neutral, phase to phase. It really comes down to how your loads are distributed. Uh, usually in, in most PQ applications, uh, a phase to neutral is going to reveal more information. And what I mean by that is that, particularly when it comes to harmonics, you wanna look for things like triplets, which are basically the negative sequencing harmonics uh, that don't cancel out and, and they add in the neutral. And so depending on the type of harmonic generators or, or I would say the nonlinear loads that causes those zero sequencing harmonics, uh, you know, they, they add in the neutral. So the neutral is going to give you, with the presence of a neutral, will give you uh, the most results uh, in a PQ application. Uh, even if you don't monitor the current, uh, you can still see where events might be occurring just simply by observing, monitoring the neutral to ground voltage. Let's, let's think about it, when you have a fault that basically occurs on the, let's say at the load, so the load is gonna draw all this fault current, that recurrent returns back through the neutral, what's gonna happen when it, when it uh, uh, interfaces with the impedance of the neutral? So even though you might have a dip in the voltage due to the fault, you'll have a corresponding increase in the voltage on the neutral. So that's an example of, monitoring um, you know, PQ events 
without having to monitor the current. Now today's instrumentation now is always suggested that you monitor the current. Why? Because you want to take advantage of the instrument's algorithm that uses that relationship between voltage and current doing a, uh, a PQ event to give you that upstream downstream tag that I referred to earlier. Uh, PQ, should you monitor the current? Yes, uh, for the reason that I just stated uh, and so forth. Instrument connections nowadays, uh, these instruments are becoming more and more sophisticated uh, as far as uh, providing information, providing what I call um, checkpoints to determine if you're connected properly based on the instrument, uh, the circuit configuration. Uh, so that's very important. In this example here, this is a, an instrument that uses those checks and balances, so to speak, to determine uh, the circuit type. Are you connected as the diagram says you are? Uh, do you have enough current? Uh, the most common mistake that's made uh, for this particular instrument, how it detects if everything is uh, checks out all right, is it looks for things like if you're under current. And that typically happens when you have a CT whose range is too large for the current that you're actually monitoring. This instrument actually has the intelligence to recognize that um, and it flags you appropriately. Uh, it also has a phaser display that tells you how you should be connected um, based on the circuit type. So again, you know, today's instrumentation is becoming more, more sophisticated internally, but makes your life easier as far as using it in an actual application. Uh, again, this is another uh, example of the smarts that are built in today's uh, instrumentation that will basically tell you if you're connected properly, if you have another very common um, mistake that's made is inverted CTs. Uh, all CTs, current probes, what have you, they all have polarity markers, but you know sometimes we overlook those things uh, and the instrumentation will tell you when you have such, uh, such a scenario. Very important, the transducer considerations. Um, and again, you, you wanna make sure that when we talk about transducers, really as far as our instrumentation, we're really talking about current probes and CTs. Uh, more importantly, make sure that the current probe or CT is sized appropriately. Uh, making sure that the arrow is orientated, uh, orientated correctly. Uh, the general rule of thumb is the arrow should always point in the direction of normal current flow. Uh, anytime that you have current that flows in the opposite direction, most instrumentation will flag it as seeing as negative KW, which means that you have reverse flow. So either you're going to have reverse flow as a result of uh, reverse polarity on your current probe, or you actually might have reverse flow. The load is actually uh, acting as a generator. And that happens in a lot of cases. Um, when it comes to PQ, a lot of times, you know, most instruments, uh, if it's UL, that means that it's used in low voltage applications. An example of low voltage applications is up to 600 volts. A lot of times these instruments might be used in medium and high voltage applications. Well, you know, obviously you can't, in a medium or a high voltage application, you can't bring those voltages directly to the instrument voltage inputs. So in, in those cases, you're going to apply, uh, you're going to uh, add either a PT, a potential transformer, or you're going to add a voltage divider, uh, depending on the uh, objective of the application. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind is that um, those type of devices can have uh, devices can have limited bandwidth, so they can affect the uh, monitoring results. They can act as filters, uh, as far filtering out the very same event that you're trying to detect and mitigate. So you, you want to keep those things in mind, uh, and that is what we mean by transducer considerations. Instrument settings. Where do I set the instrument? Um, it depends on uh, what method 
uh, the instrument is using as far as acquired data. Uh, most instruments will use what is called report by exception. And the way that works is that gives the user ability to determine what is normal and they can set the appropriate limits. For example, in this slide here, 1159, IEEE of Revit 1159 recommends plus or minus 10% of your nominal voltage. So in this case here, if uh, nominal voltage is 480, we're gonna set a high limit at 528 and a low limit at 432. And, and so what happens in that scenario that if I have an RMS variation that exceeds the high limit, it's going to be recorded and characterized as a swell. Conversely, if it goes below 432, it's gonna be characterized and, uh, as a SAG. Um, but again, this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is a variable here. We, rec we recommend 10%. Most utilities will use a 10% tolerance. So if you think that you're having low voltage problems at the point of common coupling, enough to a point where the utility is gonna come out and put a meter uh, on the point of common coupling, and if the voltage stays within that 10% of whether the normal is, you know, whether it's a 208, 120, or whether it's, you know, 480, 277, or where it might be 4160, if the voltage stays within that window, utilities are going to look at it at, hey, we're within, you know, the proper specifications. Environment considerations, that's another thing to keep, uh, to keep in mind, um, especially for PQ, are the surge suppressors uh, being utilized because it can affect the monitoring results? Are there other mitigation devices like uh, TBSSs, things of that nature? Um, for energy, knowing the types of loads that are, uh, are deployed, lighting, things of that nature. It's always good to see the big picture. And then there's a sanity check. Before you walk away from that portable instrument, uh, there's the sanity check, I like to call it. You know, verify that the instrument is connected properly. You know, as I stated earlier, with today's uh, instrument being really more sophisticated and having to check the balances to make sure that you are properly connected, uh, that is a benefit to users. Uh, Real-time meters is one way to ver uh, one way of a sanity check. You know, verify your voltage, your amperage readings are you know as expected. Uh, you use things, tools like the scope mode and phaser diagram to verify proper wiring. Uh, those are the two most commonly tools that are used to you know as far as uh, the sanity check. And then for PQ, um, you compare real-time meters to your thresholds. Um, that's very important. Um, another common transducer scale factors, uh, you know, every current probe or CT is going to have some type of scale factor or ratio. Uh, you want to make sure that the instrument that's making the measurement, you want to make sure that it has the proper scale factors and ratios for the current probe or CT that you're using. Then you monitor for a short period of time and you view the results. Uh, it, it's always a good idea to, you know, rather than, okay, I'm going out to the site, you know, I'm gonna install it. And then the next time I'm gonna decide is to retrieve the instrument. You know, I, I mean, you can do that, but it's always a good idea to maybe, especially if it's gonna be a longer term type of uh, survey, it's always a good idea to visit the site for a short period of time. Uh, if you can grab some data, review the results. Why do I do that? Because number one, you may have immediately found the problem. Number two, you may have to make an adjustment as far as the instrument setting. So you may have to tweak it. Uh, so those would be the primary reasons why I would recommend that, you know, if it's a longer term type of uh, monitoring survey that you want to visit the site periodically to check on the meter, so to speak. How long and when to monitor for PQ? Uh, and, and usually it's, you know, you might see, uh, you might monitor until you record the event or until you record something significant that you think might be causing the problem. Uh, but, you know, I've seen monitoring surveys that can be a week, that can be a month. Uh, 
a month to seem more common, especially if you're doing energy uh, monitoring because you want to try to match the billing cycle of the utility. Um, but typically one week might be common, even one day. And again, one day, you might find the results within one day, um, that type of scenario. So then after you've, uh, after you've acquired this data, then comes the data analysis and review. To me, for me, this is the fun part because it allows you, number one, to select the correct mitigation depending on what your monitor objectives are. Um, and, you know, for example, load related, uh, I would say con consumer related problems such as power factor correction. Now, power factor correction is an interesting one because depending on how it's utilized, you know, from or from the end user standpoint, is utilized as far as uh, correcting power factor, making you more efficient. From the utility standpoint, it's used for voltage regulation. So it all it, it all depends on from what perspective. But nevertheless, when they occur, they cause a certain type of PQ event that can cause nuisance tripping and um, what I would call um, three-phase rectifier type loads. One, one that uses an architecture where the front end is rectified to a DC link that drives an inverter. Uh, it seems like uh, every load these days are using that type of uh, architecture. Uh, it's notorious for nuisance tripping when they see this type of event. And then again, for motor inrush. Uh, motor inrush is, uh, is a load-related problem. Obviously, you know, this is a classic signature of a motor inrush or startup. And, and so the objective here is not necessarily what the current is doing, but when this inrush occurs, as you can see this uh, slight reduction in voltage, you know, how deep is that reduction? And is it deep enough to where it's going to cause loads that are on the same circuit to misoperate? That's what the concern is. And so if you identify, you've gone out and you say you've, you had a scenario where you have servers that are, that are basically you know, resetting all the time and you go out and you monitor the supply power that's feeding the servers and you see this type of event here, well, then the first thing you're going to focus on is how deep is that voltage sag? And then you compare it to the specifications of the server. And if you have that consistent correlation, well, there you have the smoking gun. So now the next step is how do I mitigate this? Uh, you know, do I go with uh, uh, soft starts? Do I do I put a uh, uh, variable speed drive in the motor? Uh, there's, so there's a number of different ways to mitigate it. But the important thing is that you have the information that allows you to select the correct mitigation. Flicker. Uh, you know, flicker is uh, can be a problem, and not uh, and, and usually from from the human standpoint, uh, where you can actually have light flicker that can actually make you nauseated, nauseous. Uh, and usually the the my uh, the value in which most people will perceive flicker is usually what we call the PST. That's one of the indices that are used in flicker measurement uh, perceptibility short term. And usually when the perceptibility short-term exceeds a value as one, most people will perceive light flicker. Um, and so there are many cases in which flicker have actually caused people to become ill. Uh, a very common application these days is, uh, I don't know why it's doing this, it's malfunctioning here, but uh, a very common application in terms of harmonics, uh, everyone wants to know if they have 519 compliant. Um, and so, you know, the, uh, the latest harmonic standard, uh, 519, 2014, uh, is a, a great tool for that. Now, when you get into more specific problems, uh, you know, in this, in the first example here is verifying the, uh, the effectiveness of this particular device, which is a UPS. A UPS can be thought of as a mitigating type of device. Uh, the mindset there is that the output of the UPS stays within a certain window 
uh, that is feeding critical loads. Well, clearly we see in this case here where that was not the case. So this is an output of a UPS. We can see here where there was an instance in which we exceeded that window. So now your critical loads that are, uh, that are downstream of the UPS is seeing this. So this is a clear scenario in which this particular UPS exhibit a failure for this at this particular point. In fact, uh, this response was uh, to a voltage sag that occurred on the input side of the UPS. So if the UPS is working correctly, then the output should have never varied, should have stayed within this window. So there was clearly an issue with the UPS. It later turned out to be a UPS failure issue. And then of course, there's the PQ standards, the EN5160 has been around for decades. A lot of people still use that to see if they're complying as far as power quality. And here's an example of a EN5160 report. Uh, there's other types of uh, reports. There's, you know, susceptibility curves like you know, the Sabima curve, for example, you know, it's a uh, susceptibility curve that was uh, developed back in the late 1970s. It was a way for users to take resulting data from a data set and plot it on this curve to be able to determine is, does this have the potential of causing a problem? Does it have a potential of causing a failure? Does it have a potential of causing uh, a misoperation, a restart, things of that nature? Uh, Today's there's newer versions of these susceptibility curves. Uh, first one that comes to my mind is the ITIC curve, which is kind of ITIC, ITIC, uh, which is uh, a newer version of the Sabima and sort of reflect today's loads. Because a lot of times what happens to you, you'll, and if you'll put an instrument out, it'll collect data, you have the data set, and you see the resulting data. And if you don't have a corresponding let's say failure or some sort of a negative occurrence that corresponds with the data that you've recorded, then usually the first question that you're gonna ask, is this good or bad? And, and so that's when you would usually plot it against some sort of susceptibility curve, whether it's a susceptibility curve that you develop yourself. Today's software allows you to produce these susceptibility curves or you're gonna compare it against a, um, you know, like a Sabima curve or an IT curve. Is another example, and this this is probably the most common utility event that you that you will see if you're monitoring at the point of common coupling. And this is a case here where clearly we had a fault, a uh, single line of ground fault, which is you know the most common uh, utility event. Could have been a branch or something hit the feeder line and then cleared. You can see it in case where it cleared. Uh, there's different ways of doing it uh, from a waveform perspective. A lot of people like to see waveforms or from what we call an RMS chart. And from the RMS chart, you can clearly see where the faulted phase was. And using PQ rules, we can clearly see that this was uh, an upstream event. Uh, here's the voltage, here's the current. Notice that they have the same polarity. Uh, and using PQ rules, that usually indicates that it's an upstream, upstream event. This is the type of information that if you have documented enough to where, okay, now you need to get someone involved here as far as what's causing this and, and to clean this up, this is something that you would go to your utility account representative with. Uh, and then, you know, where did the, did the problem occur while monitoring? You know, that'd be the ideal situation because why you're, uh, if it occurred while you're monitoring, then you have record of it. Um, and of course, look for events that coincide with equipment malfunctions. It's not, I mean, that's easy said, it's easier said than done. Um, because if that was, if that happened all the time, it would make everyone's life a whole lot easier as far as uh, uh, solving PQ problems. Uh, were there any events recorded? The problem occurred. You, you know, you can see we go down the line here. Um, the thing that I look for here is identify data that exceeds equipment specifications. So you have the nameplate information of the equipment. 
you compare it with the, the, uh, the data set that's been recorded by the monitor. And if you see anything in the data set that exceeds the equipment specifications, although you may not have a failure then, you actually have an environment, the devices in the environment in which you can have a premature failure. Because now you have your power parameters is constantly exceeding the equipment specifications. Um, so that's, that's a very important thing to note as well. And then for you know, energy data analysis and review, it's largely dependent on the survey objectives. Uh, you know, cases that I've usually seen, it usually see is it's usually either region oriented where, or I would you know, rephrase that and say maybe campus, you might have this campus that may have several buildings on the campus. Uh, and so the objectives might be, what's the energy profile of any one building? And then of course, what's the overall energy profile of the entire campus? So it really depends on the survey objectives and you really have to take it on a case by case basis. And, and why do you do this? Well, obviously uh, you record baseline information. Uh, it gives you areas in which you can maybe target it for reduction if your energy bill is, uh, if your energy use is too high. But the two most common that I see is here. Uh, maybe you deployed some energy saving devices. You want to see if they're working, if they're being effective. If, if you've been sold on the fact that if I put this device in place, it's going to save you 30, 20, 30 percent energy savings. Well, you want to see if that works. So obviously you want to have monitoring in place to, uh, to ensure that. And then the thing that I see a lot is comparison to the utility bill. Utility bill say, hey, you use X, to num X number of... Uh, KWH, but the instrumentation says that you did. And a lot of times we've seen instances where the meters themselves, the utility meters themselves have been inaccurate. Uh, so that's something else to consider. The other thing that I want to add, if I just want to jump back up, I went too far back, is I want to jump back here to this particular slide. Uh, when you find yourself in a what we call a, a, a PQ troubleshooting scenario. And, and I see this all the time where you'll have this scenario. Uh, client is seeing problems with a piece of equipment, uh, premature failure, misoperation, things of that nature. Uh, they have no history of monitoring at all. Uh, they just know that the piece of equipment is failing it's causing you know, significant economical impact, et cetera, et cetera. So they call in the vendor for that piece of equipment. The vendor comes in, they run a series of tests and they say, well, you know, it's, uh, it's not the equipment, it must be the power. It's not us, it must be the power. So then the vendor, so then the client goes out, the client will either rent something or if, if it's significant enough, they'll purchase their own. And then they monitor and they find all these inconsistencies in the power. Um, so then they determine if it's power related. Um, another scenario, which is more commonplace, is that the monitor is put in place to monitor supply power and find out that the power is absolutely clean on the wind specs. And they go back to the vendor and they present that information to the vendor and says, no, it's not a power related issue. The vendor comes out again and does another survey and all of a sudden they find issues with the piece of equipment. The point is, is that because you've gone out and you're monitoring, you haven't recorded anything significant, does not mean that you've wasted your time. If you apply to any general troubleshooting scenario, you've just basically eliminated one potential component that can cause the issue. So that's the point that I wanted to make back then. So now, what are the next steps here? Uh, you know, I've, I've determined that I have an issue. Uh, what, do, what are the next steps? Uh, and so the question is, do you have the in-house uh, expertise? Most do not these days. Maybe back in the old days they did, uh, but most do not these days. Um, so if you don't, then who do you call? It all depends on what's causing the, uh, where the problems are originating from, this PQ, uh, if it's utility, 
you call you your customer you I call the uh, utility your account representative uh, that would be the first person that you would call uh, if it's internal to your facility then that's generally when you would bring in uh, you know if you don't have in-house resources in you know, like an engineering or electrical department which typically are rare these days uh, then you're usually bringing in a third party source could be electrical contractor, could be a consultant. And, and so the first thing, you know, in today's world, since a lot of the instrumentation that's being introduced to the market today is, or, uh, is sophisticated in terms of not requiring uh, a lot of expertise as far as setting the instrument up to collect data, uh, have the ability to basically tell you where the events are originating from upstream and downstream. In other words, they have you know, they have the smarts, the algorithms built in where, you know, someone with very limited experience can be contracted in to do a job and can take an instrument off the shelf, go out, do the survey for, you know, a month, 30 days, um, run it through the software, generate a multi-page report with all the information submitted to the end user and say, okay, survey done, that'll be X number of dollars. Uh, today's instrumentation makes it very easy for someone to do that with very limited or no TQ experience at all. So when you bring it in, when you bring in that third party, that's the first thing you want to uh, determine. Do they have the expertise? Because now you have this multi-page document that, a, a, let's say, a contractor or a consultant provided, and you ask questions about the document. That is where the oil and water is going to separate. Uh, if the consultant contractor is competent, they'll be able to explain, explain every aspect of the document and give you a clear understanding of what's going on. If they don't, then you're basically going to get, if I can be crude, a lot of foo foo dust. Okay. So the point is, is, you know, uh, make sure they have a proven history, check references. That's the, the takeaway from here.